Now, every biblical discussion about personal finances and getting aligned with the heart of God starts with this principle that God owns it all. This passage I love out of the end of 1 Chronicles 29 in the uh, journey of Israel and the kings. It is David that gives this prayer. And uh, he is at the end of his career. In fact, that chapter finishes. The next chapter, starting 2 Chronicles, is Solomon becomes the king. So he's right at that transition, succession process. And uh, what he's so happy about in this prayer is the generosity of his people. They have given enough to totally fund the building project. And he's given huge amounts of gold and materials out of his own personal net worth. And so he has this prayer, and we're going to unpack part of the prayer. But the point in this first of a few verses we'll look at in 1 Chronicles 29 is what he says by the Spirit's revelation of where God is in this thing of our stuff and having it and are we the owner and what does God expect from us? He says these words, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the glory and the power, the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. That doesn't leave much out, does it? <laughs> everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom you are exalted as head over all. Now, if we go to other scriptures, we find that God breaks that down. Everything in heaven and earth is yours, but what does that really mean? And what does it mean like in 2015 for me? Well, let's start with the verse on the land. The land, this comes in Leviticus, uh, where the, the instructions are being given for the children of Israel as they're beginning their journey and developing into a nation. And God writes, the land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. So the land is not to be seen as ours. Now, Many of us probably own some land. It might have a house on it, <laughs> and it has a title to it with our name on it. And it's good to operate from a, uh, a you know, poor perspective of thinking that's really ours. Many of us remember that in the sabbatical year in Israel's culture, the land went back to the original owner. And if you had mortgaged part of it or somebody had taken part of it, it went back, and it was a great reminder to Israel, that land is not yours. God owns the land. But it's not only the land, it's also the money. And this is where it begins to hurt, because I think people get paychecks with their name on it here. Is that right? <laughs> Somebody in payroll? And you say, I work hard, you know, for those two weeks or whatever the payroll cycle is here. And uh, the money, God owns it? That's not right. Well, Haggai said, the silver is mine. This is God speaking. Uh, the silver is mine. And the gold is mine, declares the Lord God Almighty. So we've got our real estate. Now we've got our paycheck that God says he owns. And then there's a verse out of Psalms that uh, is, uh, well, actually, we'll go here to 1 Chronicles uh, 29. Wealth and honor come from you. Whatever is in our paycheck, whatever our ability is to earn a living, wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. What does this verse say? It says, we would not be able to do our job if God did not give us health and strength today. Uh, yesterday in our men's group, we prayed for some brother-in-law or something, that young family, young uh, little children, and this man just got Lou Gehrig's disease. And we, our, our ability to even come to work and function and earn a living is only because of God's grace, wealth and honor, whatever our paycheck is. If we've been exalted and we've been promoted to a position, it's because God has been at work and been gracious uh, to us. So our paycheck, yeah, uh, God, uh, God says, I make that possible for you. And uh, actually, it's mine that I'm just sharing with you along the way. And then this uh, verse out of Psalm uh, chapter 50, I have no need of a bull from your stall, Goats from your pens, every animal of the forest is mine, cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. Now we could add in there, 
I have no need of your offering either, <laughs> which opens another whole topic that we'll talk about in the giving lesson. God does not need our generosity, but there are deeper reasons that uh, are at work when God says, I invite you into the joy of generosity. Now, so far, this is, per- this is a pretty depressing message this early in the morning, right? <laughs> you know, what I have is not mine. You know, you mean, I'm going ha- to finish paying off my car in three months, and I get the title, and you say, that's not your car now? I mean, this is kind of a depressing message early in the morning, but it gets better. But before we go there, uh, I was just thinking driving in this morning, would I really want the responsibility that God takes by owning everything? I mean, think about, <laughs> think about children of Israel in the wilderness. Would I like to be responsible for feeding a million people out in the sand? <clears throat> getting the wa- water out of a rock, you know, getting the, what was it, partridges or whatever they were to fly so low, they just grabbed them. Would I like to have that responsibility? No. Or even today, you know, having the responsibility of dispensing all of the gifts and the abilities and the energy and the health, the gift of healing that we have. Would I like to have the responsibility? I think bottom line, if we think about it, we'll be pretty glad that God owns it all and takes that responsibility. But the news gets better. God does own it all, and there are some ways that we can recognize that and, in fact, practice it in a very, uh, very specific way that we'll uh, probably deal with later in one of our lessons. But here's the bottom line of this. Every spending or financial decision is a spiritual one. If you buy into the first point of our lesson today, that God owns it all, then whatever we do with our stuff, money, house, car, etc., should be a spiritual decision because our spiritual Heavenly Father, we are just managers for Him. We are not the owners. Every spending and financial decision is a spiritual one. But by and large, well, certainly outside of the faith, the believing community, this question is never asked. And uh, I'm afraid many times within the believing community, we do not ask God, what do you want me to do with this? Do you want me to spend my money on this? Or what, what do you want me to do? It's yours. The money, the land, the house, the car. Uh, Ray and I over the years have, uh, as I said, awakened our heart 10 years ago. But <laughs> we've had some great experiences just asking that question about our house that we've had here and there. And I was thinking of the people and the families that have lived with us over the year. Because we've taken the position, it's God's house. When we were in California, a Mexican family with five children moved into our house for a number of months. You go, how did that work out? It worked out wonderful. Luis and Rosa Rocha are still lifelong friends, and their kids, uh, they keep in touch with us from around the country. And and there is a great joy of, as some have said, holding things loosely and saying, God, how do you want to use it? Every spending financial decision, decision with our material possessions, Uh, is a spiritual one. Now, it'll also influence how we care for our God's possessions. If you borrow something from someone, what do you want to do when when you return it to them? Have it in as good or better shape than it was when you got it, right? Uh, Our son, who's a chaplain over at John Brown University now, uh, when we all lived in California, our family, we would go up to the Sierras to a uh, university cabin, they called it. Thir- it housed 38 people. And our kids loved to go there because it had lofts to climb around in when our kids were little and grandkids. And uh, we were cleaning up after being there a week and uh, basically uh, using it well. And I said something, oh, that's, that's good enough, Rod. That's good enough. He goes, Dad, you said, and this is where the grandchildren are listening, <laughs> Dad, you said, Always leave it better than you found it. We got to go and clean there. <laughs> okay, Rod, I got it. I got it. You know. <sighs> Be careful what you say. But we will care for God's things better if we just have this in mind. God's owning it. God owns it, and he's watching how we do it. It does demand, however, a major shift in our thinking when we begin to see our material possessions as God sees them. By nature, we see them as ours to do what we want to do with them. And if we can move our thinking just a bit to, no, God has loaned this to me for a period of time, and I need to care for it, hold it loosely, have it available for God, uh, it's a major shift if we can move to that. Now, 
How do we change our thinking? One, meditate on 1 Chronicles 29, the passage that we've already looked at. Yours, O God, is the glory and the majesty and the power and the greatness. Everything in heaven and in earth is yours. Wealth and honor come from you. You're the ruler of all things. You may want to memorize that and uh, just have it there to call upon when you uh, get to engage in uh, the material things. Be aware of the Lord's ownership of all that you have. God, I don't own anything. In the estate design class that I teach, uh, just did on Saturday night, there's an exercise in that, thinking about how we handle our final uh, instructions for what we have accumulated and left at the end of, a life, you know, end of our life. There's a legal way to make this very visual of we don't own it. And uh, I have fun talking about that in uh, that class. Uh, be careful of the use of my, mine, and ours. That's our na natural tendency. Look at my new car. You know, this, in fact, from a pastoral perspective, I, uh, I cringe a little bit when, when people talk about my church. And I'm so glad for the DNA here at Fellowship of you know, no names and names nowhere, fingerprints everywhere. Now, because we can so often move into, it's mine, it's my. I did it, I did it. Now, you don't have to go crazy on this one, this point, and get a vanity plate that says God's car. You know, it's okay if you have your, your own plate with whatever you want, the hogs on it or whatever. Okay, but it's an attitude, you know, of just saying, God, is, God has given me this house to live in. God has given me this car to drive. Uh, whatever, in our material possession. And the last one, begin to consider God's choices for his things. God, what do you want me to do with this? Uh, again, just thinking about this class, at one point we had a, when I was doing a church plan up in South Dakota, a young man called from New York State who had just gotten out of high school, and he said, I, I like to build things, and you know, I understand you got to remodel this building on the first property you bought. I want to come and do that and volunteer. So he came, lived in our house, and after he'd been there, I don't know, few months or a year, he needed to go back to New York. He didn't have a car. And uh, he goes, I, I'd, I'd like to go back. I, my sister's getting married. I forget the details. I said, Doug, just take our family car. What? I'm 20 years old. You, you would give me your car to go across, halfway across the United States? Yeah, it's God's car. You know, there's some simple things that we can do. It, 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 it has brought great joy to Ray and I over the years. So let's not get too, uh, too dark about God owns it all. It really is a good thing.